Hello and welcome to lecture number 15. We are on the 15th lecture of this uh, lecture series on jet aircraft propulsion. I guess by now you might have um, got some idea about what this course is all about. Of course, we had given a lot of introduction in the first few lectures and uh, we are probably almost halfway through this lecture series wherein we have been discussing a lot about what are the different types of um, cycles that are used in jet aircraft propulsion. How is it that we can analyze a jet uh, aircraft uh, engine cycle thermodynamically? We have looked at the basic thermodynamic cycle, the ideal cycle of jet aircraft engines, then what are the component performance parameters that can be incorporated and of course, the real cycle analysis of jet engines. Now, subsequent to all this discussion, we have initiated our a detailed discussion about different components of the aircraft engine and in the last lecture we have discussed about the compressors now compressors are one of the uh, probably one of the most important components of a jet engine of course all the components are definitely important Compre uh, compressor is one of the most more important components of a jet engine and we have initiated some discussion on how we can analyze a compressor and what are the different terminologies used in compressor uh, design and its analysis and what is the simplistic way of analyzing a compressor. So, we have initiated the discussion on a 2D, two dimensional basis wherein we have um, discussed about one cross section of the compressor trying to look at the rotor and the stator combination that is a stage of a compressor and how we can be, uh, go about some preliminary analysis of uh, a certain uh, rotor and a stator combination. Now, during this discussion, we have um, discovered that for such an analysis, it is necessary for us to get the velocity triangles right. Velocity triangle is basically um, a combination, a vector representation, a vectorial representation of the different components of velocity in an axial compressor. Now, in an axial compressor, as we know, in the rotor, especially because of the very fact that the rotor has a, a rotation a tangential component, a blade speed, a peripheral speed associated with it that results in uh, the incoming velocity to take up two different velocity components. That is, if an observer were to stand outside the rotor and then see what is happening, then he sees a certain, uh, certain velocity. Now, if the same observer is actually sitting on the rotor, then because of the fact that there is a relative motion between the rotor and the incoming flow, there is a different velocity which the, the observer would see. So, these are velocity components in different frames of reference and uh, so, th this, uh, this basically constitutes a velocity triangle and so, uh, fundamental design and analysis of compressors begin with the velocity triangle. So, I, I'm, I guess uh, you would have uh, understood how to construct a velocity triangle from our discussion in the last lecture and also um, how is it that velocity triangles can help us in a better understanding and design of uh, axial compressors. Now, in today's lecture, what we are going to discuss is a slightly different topic. Of course, it is still related to the compressors, but it is probably on a more simple, uh, simpler level because we, what we are going to discuss initially is something to do with a stationary row of blades like a stator. So, in today's lecture, we are going to basically talk about what is meant by a cascade. So, we will begin our analysis or discuss our discussion today on cascade analysis, what we mean by a cascade, we will we'll take a look at what is a cascade wind tunnel and then we will also try to understand the nomenclature associated with a cascade. There are a lot of angles and velocity components and other geometric parameters which are involved. We will discuss about that during the cascade nomenclature. We will then talk about what are the different losses. Uh, that probably we can uh, detect or determine from the cascade analysis and how we can evaluate the performance of a given blade. So, these are some of the topics that we are going to take up for uh, today's discussion. Now, let us first understand what is meant by a cascade and why is it that we should be discussing about a cascade. Now, cascade uh, at least literally it means a series of certain things. We have uh, probably you must have when you have read certain books or magazines, you must have uh, read about this phrase of cascading effect and so on, wherein it is basically meant that a series of certain event is repeating and it carries on. So, that is the fundamental uh, literal meaning of cascade and in this context that we are going to discuss today, it is probably in some sense the same thing because. 
cascade in, in our terminology here refers to a series of blades which are ar arranged in a certain uh, repetitive fashion and uh, cascade is basically a series of stationary blades. So, you might wonder why should we be even bothered about a, a set of stationary blades and how does it help us in our analysis of compressors which primarily comprise of rotors and then of course, there are stators. So, how, how can we gain any beneficial information from a series or a set of stationary blades? Well, that is not really true because cascade does play a very significant role in our understanding of uh, compressors and the performance and behavior of a series of blades. So, basically the idea of a cascade is that if we have a set of blades which are arranged in a certain fashion, which is how it would be in a compressor, but just that in a compressor the blades are usually arranged uh, along uh, uh, on a disc and in, in a uh, on a shaft basically. Whereas, in a cascade in a linear cascade blades are arranged in a straight line in, a, in one plane. Whereas, in um, in a rotor or a stator the blades are not really arranged in a stationary in a linear fashion, but it is arranged on a rotary frame. So, uh, that is one of the differences between a cascade and of course, um, the, the actual blades. So, what is the basic uh, uh, requirement of a cascade? Well, basically a cascade is meant uh, to understand or give us some better understanding of a set of blades which are used in a similar fashion to that of, of, of compressors, but in a much more simplistic fashion. Now, yeah, so the, the, the idea of using cascades was developed long ago in the early days when compressor um, compressors were actually being developed and designed in the initial stages, maybe 60 years earlier or 60 to 70 years earlier on. So, it was probably in the early 30s or 1940s that cascade bla um, cascades uh, came to be uh, of use for very simple testing and analysis of um, compressor. In fact, even in uh, cascades are used even for turbines, but today we will discuss about compressor cascades. So, it was long back that these um, test methods were developed and they have been used ever since. It is still being used very popularly even today. But the difference between um, the, 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 the significance of cascades today and what it was 40, 50 years ago is different in the sense that in today's technology, lot of uh, significance is also given to numerical analysis or computational analysis. So, with the development and um, use of um, computational tools like computational fluid dynamics. So, the, the significance of cascades probably has uh, been um, slightly lower than what it was many years ago, but it does have uh, um, it does have a lot of significance because there is a lot of uncertainty even till date on some of the data that you get from uh, computational analysis. So, cascade is still used for validation of some of these computational tools. So, as I mentioned cascade consists of a series an array of blades which are arranged in a certain fashion and they are the, these blades are representative of the blades which would be used in an actual uh, uh, compressor. But the difference is that usually cascades have blades which are two dimensional which means that they, they are like airfoil sections which are extruded infinitely. Unlike an axial compressor where the blades are not necessarily two dimensional where the blades may have a twist and the blades can take three dimensional shapes which is not true for a cascade. And so, to ensure that the flow is two dimensional in a cascade what is done is basically that we should ensure that uh, the end walls of the cascade does not have boundary layer effects and therefore, most of the cascades usually have end walls which are porous or there is a provision provided for removing boundary layer and that ensures that the flow entering the cascade is two dimensional. One of the most important uh, distinguishing features of a cascade is because it is now two dimensional we can safely ensure or exclude radial variations in uh, the properties that is radial vari variations of uh, velocity and pressure and so on can be safely excluded because we have ensured that the flow entering the cascade is two dimensional and since the cascade blades themselves are two dimensional, this will safely ensure that we can 
uh, leave out or exclude radial variations of different properties. So, what does basically cascade do? Cascade basically relates or tries to give us some in, uh, information, in fact a lot of information on how does a given set of blades behave uh, in terms of the pressure rise that is on the blade surface that is the C p distribution static pressure distribution on the blade surface as well as the losses that are encountered um, on in total pressure because of frictional effects and so on that is at the trailing edge of these blades. And how does these parameters change for a given turning of the blade. So, we have for example, if I am to design a new series of blades which are to be used in an actual compressor. Now, one of the ways of course, to do that is to design the blades, fabricate the blades as it is and then test them in an actual rig. But, the amount of time and uh, effort and of course, money that is required for testing actual compressor blades in actual um, geometry is substantial. And therefore, we would like to first take a look at a simplistic analysis, which can tell us whether the blade is likely to perform well when it is actually implemented in a compressor. So, cascade is one such way wherein we can get very quick results, very quick turnaround from the experiments by very simple experiments, but at the same time they give a lot of insight into the performance of these blades. So, cascade analysis can give us um, how the blades are going to perform as we keep changing the inflow angle that is known as incidence which we will define a little later. How does the blade perform as you keep changing the incidence angle and what is the total pressure loss that this kind of a blade geometry is going to give us. So, these are some of the information that uh, cascade analysis can give us and that plays a very significant role in uh, detailed design and analysis of the compressor blades. So, it is necessary that we first have a simplistic and a quicker uh, experiment which can give us a lot of details and uh, that can help us a lot in our understanding of uh, the performance and behavior of these blades. So, that is one of the aspects of uh, or beauty of cascade analysis. So, a cascade basically consists of as I said a series of blades and these blades are usually mounted on a turntable that is these blades are, as I will show you a little later that, is, that these blades which are arranged in a certain fashion they are mounted on a turntable which means that the whole set of blades can be rotated about a given axis. And so, as you rotate these set of blades, you are basically changing the incidence or the angle at which the flow is actually entering the uh, cascade. So, you can change the um, incidence of these blades because the blades are mounted on a turntable. And uh, what is it that we measure in cascades? Measurement usually consists of pressures of course, and then velocities and flow angles downstream of the cascade. Besides of course, these fundamental properties uh, nowadays we also end up measuring the boundary layer properties, the skin friction and lot of other measurements can also be done in a cascade. But fundamentally cascade analysis or measurements usually consist of pressure, velocities and flow angles. And these are usually carried out by uh, moving or traversing a probe at the trailing edge of these cascade blades. And uh, on the blade surface, what we basically measure are the static pressures on both the suction surface as well as the pressure surface. And uh, these cascade blades when they are fa fabricated or manufactured, they usually have these pressure tabs uh, embedded on uh, the cascade blade. So, pressure tabs mounted or embedded on the uh, blade surface will help us in giving us some idea about the static pressure distribution on these blades because the C p distribution gives us a lot of information about uh, the loading of the blade that is how much force or how much work can this blade do on the flow. And so, uh, that is obviously an indication of the pressure rise which the cascade can uh, cascade can basically give us. So, all these uh, simple informations, so all these fundamental informations which of course, form the basis for very detailed analysis can be obtained from a cascade analysis. So, let us now take a look at a, a typical cascade wind tunnel. So, we will now appreciate what this cascade is all about because I uh, till now I have just been talking about cascade being a series of blades and so on. So, let us take a look at a wind tunnel a cascade wind tunnel uh, 
and see what are the different components which constitute um, a cascade wind tunnel. Because there are different types of cascade wind tunnels, we will see one of the types of cascade wind tunnels which are commonly used. Now, this uh, wind tunnel which is shown in this picture here is a linear uh, wind tunnel. It is a linear wind tunnel because the blades are arranged in a linear fashion. You can see here these are the cascade blades. I mentioned initially that cascade blades basically consist of blades which are arranged in a linear fashion. So, these are the blades which are arranged in a certain fashion self similar blades and since they are arranged linearly it is called a linear cascade. There are also annular cascades where these blades are arranged in an annular fashion which basically represent uh, a stator blade and uh, the other parameter that is mentioned here is linear open circuit cascade. An open circuit means that the flow is uh, sucked in from the atmosphere and exhausted through the cascade that the flow is not recirculated. There are also wind tunnels which are known as closed circuit wind tunnels wherein the same flow will enter into a loop and then it is circulated within the uh, test section and the cascade. So, this is known as uh, in, in, in such a case that is known as an, a closed circuit cascade. Here it is called an open circuit because the ambient air is uh, sucked in and then it is exhausted. It is not the same air which is continuously recirculated. So, what are the different components? You can see here there is a motor. This is the motor that is shown here. This motor is driving an axial fan which generates the required mass flow for the uh, cascade. So, this fan is driving a certain mass flow which is what basically passes through the cascade. Now, the fan sucks in air from the ambient through a set of screens because you would like the flow uh, to be uh, smooth as well as to eliminate the possibility of some foreign objects getting uh, hitting on the fan and damaging it. So, there usually would be a set of screens before the fan. And then after the fan we have a diffuser which builds in the static pressure required and then there is a settling chamber and also you can see there are lot of wire mesh screens. So, all these wire mesh screens basically are meant to break down larger eddies in the flow, um, reduce the turbulence in the flow because the fan the exhaust from the fan is a relatively high turbulent flow. So, you would like to decelerate it at the same time you would like to eliminate uh, any possible turbulence which is still present in the flow. So, turbulence is reduced as it passes through these wire mesh screens and so this is basically known as a settling chamber where the flow uh, velocities are reduced and so you have a build up of stagnation pressure here because it is still not stagnant. And then at the end of the settling chamber we have a contraction. Contraction is like a nozzle, a subsonic nozzle. So, there is a reduction in area which means that uh, because it is a subsonic flow as it passes through the contraction section the flow will accelerate and as it accelerates because it is um, an accelerating flow there is also a reduction in the turbulence. So, turbulence reduces and so, at the exit of this contraction which is where the test section begins, we have a relatively um, very smooth flow which has a very low turbulence and at the same time uh, we have a uniform uh, velocity profile which enters into the cascade. That is very important because you need a very uniform velocity profile entering the cascade because we need a profile which is known a priori it should not be an arbitrary velocity profile. So, cascade is, is shown here we have these blades which are arranged in, in some fashion which I will explain later on. And then we have what you can also see here uh, mentioned as boundary layer suction slot. So, there is a slot just before the cascade which is known which are known as boundary layer which there could be multiple slots there. These are meant for removing boundary layer fluid from the end walls of the cascade. You would like to remove the boundary layer fluid because the flow entering the cascade needs to be two dimensional and that can be ensured only when we remove boundary layer from the end walls. So, that is carried out using boundary layer suction slots and so that is basically meant for removing boundary layer. And then at the exit of the cascade at the trailing edge there is a provision made wherein you can 
move a probe that is you can traverse a probe at the exit. So, that is known as the line of traverse and of course, this location of this traverse can be changed it can be at different cord lengths from the trailing edge of the blade. So, this is basically known as the line of traverse wherein the probe is moved and you can get a lot of data from in terms of stagnation pressure velocity etcetera. So, this is basically a cascade um, one form of a cascade there are other forms of cascades like annular cascades closed circuit and so on we will not go into details of that of course, you will be able to get more information on such cascades in in other textbooks and uh, other research papers. Now, let me take a closer look at uh, the cascade which I was talking about. So, if I were to uh, explore this particular region that is the cascade as in indicated here, what you see would be a set of blades arranged in this fashion. So, these are compressor blades it could also be turbine blades arranged in a linear fashion and that is why it is called a linear uh, cascade wind tunnel. Now, there are wind tunnels where these blades are arranged in on an annulus very similar to that of stator blades those are known as uh, annular cascade tunnels, but they are very rare usual cascade tunnels are linear in nature that is the blades are arranged in a linear fashion. Now, in this cascade that we have just mentioned most of the cascades will have the blades which are fixed at both the ends that is there is no tip clearance at any of these ends. But there are also cascade tunnels where there is a small gap provided at one of the ends. So, that you get a more uh, realistic approximation of uh, a rotor blade because if the cascade were to be fixed at both ends then it is just like a stator because it is stationary and it is fixed at both ends. But if it is a rotor there has to be a clearance between that rotor tip and the casing which can be achieved if, if we can fix the cascade blade at one end and leave a gap at the other. And some of the more complicated cascade um, tunnels also have a provision for creating a relative motion at the tip. Now, th now if you leave a cer certain gap at the tip it is possible that we can also ensure that the casing or the end wall has a relative motion and that is done by providing what are known as moving belts. That is you could have a belt at the cascade tip uh, let us take a look at this yeah at this end um, let us say if instead of fixing the blade here we keep the casing a little further up and also we provide a belt here which can be continuously rotated. What happens in this case is that now you have a cascade blade which means you do not have to rotate the blades you just have to rotate a, a belt which is at the tip of the cascade and then um, there is a gap between the belt and the cascade blade. So, that there is also a, a relative motion that is present at the tip of the cascade. So, these are more complicated complex uh, geometries of cascades which are often used, but some of the simpler ones do not have any such provision they, does, they do not basically have a tip clearance they would also not have a moving belt. So, those are simpler more conventional forms of cascade tunnels. Uh, some of the modern ones the recent ones have these uh, provisions where you can provide a tip clearance you could also provide a moving belt. So, that there is a, a relative motion. So, now that you have understood um, a cascade tunnel what it looks like and how cascade blades are mounted on a wind tunnel. Let us now go uh, one step ahead and define the different uh, geometric parameters which are used in a cascade. So, there are a lot of angles and velocities and other geometric parameters which are involved uh, which are used in cascade uh, terminology. So, we will define some of these terms uh, the various terms which are used in cascade analysis and then we will go ahead further and then see what is it that we can do with all this information that we get from a cascade analysis. As I mentioned cascade tests give us basically the velocity components, the pressure that static and stagnation pressures and also the flow angles that is how much the cascade blades can turn the flow. So, these are some of the information that cascade um, testing can give us and in order that we make use of these data we need to also be familiar with some of the terminologies that are used in uh, cascade uh, wind tunnel. So, let us take a look at uh, how we can define a cascade what are the different parameters which are involved here. <coughs> 
So what you see here is a, a relatively complicated picture, um, but I will simplify that for you. A lot of angles and velocity components which are shown, but they are some of them are repetitive in the sense that what we define at the inlet or leading edge of the blade is also true for the trailing edge. So, this is a typical airfoil that you can see here. Uh, I am sure you must be familiar with some of the airfoil terminologies. This is defined as the chord of the airfoil. So, it is shown here as C, that is the chord of the airfoil. In this case, it is a blade. And then the airfoil, um, most of the airfoils which are used would have a certain camber. It will not be a symmetrical airfoil. Usually, these airfoils will have a certain camber. And so, we know how to define a camber. So, this line that is shown here is known as the camber line, and then there is a max thickness for these blades and also the maximum camber at a certain location. So, ma camber uh, achieves a maximum at a certain location, the thickness achieves a certain maximum. Uh, so, those uh, I am sure you would have uh, studied this when you had some courses on airfoils. Now, if these blades were arranged in, in a fashion that is shown here, these are blades which are arranged in a fashion similar to that it would be in a cascade. So, I am showing here two blades we, and in a cascade typically there would be multiple number of blades which are arranged in the same fashion, they are sim self similar blades. Now, let us take a look at the inlet. At the inlet we have a certain velocity approaching the um, cascade blades. Uh, we have I have shown it here by C 1 which is the inlet uh, velocity and C 2 represents the exit velocity. And here we have an alpha 1 which is basically the angle at which the uh, velocity approaches the cascade and alpha 1 prime that is shown here is basically the uh, blade inlet angle because the, there is no rotation for these blades these are basically also equal to beta 1 which we had defined in the last class. So, the angle at which these blades have been designed for the blade inlet angle is basically the alpha 1 prime. The actual angle at which the flow is approaching the cascade is let us say alpha 1, which means that there is a difference between alpha 1 and alpha 1 prime. So, this angle which is indicated here as i is alpha 1 minus alpha 1 prime. So, that is known as the incidence angle. So, incidence angle is basically the angle of attack as we would have learned in uh, when you had studied aerodynamics of airfoils, the angle at which the flow is actually entering the blade, which may or may not be the same as the blade inlet angle. So, if it is different, it means there is a certain incidence which could either be positive or it could be negative. So, if alpha 1 is greater than alpha 1 prime, then we have a positive incidence and vice versa. And similarly, at the exit, we have um, C 2 which is the exit flow velocity leaving the blade trailing edge at an angle of alpha 2 and the blade outlet angle is let us say alpha 2 prime. So, alpha 2 and alpha 2 prime may not be the same just like we had an incidence at the inlet. If they are different, it means that there is a certain deviation. So, at the exit we have a certain deviation which is represented here by delta. So, deviation is basically equal to alpha 2 minus alpha 2 prime. So, we have incidence, we may have incidence at the inlet and deviation at the outlet. So, I mentioned initially that cascade blades are mounted on a turntable and as you rotate the turntable, we can change this incidence angle. We can set the incidence at angles which are desired and then we can see how these blades perform as you ch keep changing the incidence angle. So, we change in incidence the performance of the blade changes and that can that is one of the aspects which can be studied using uh, cascade testing. Now, these blades are separated by a certain distance which is shown here as uh, letter s that is the spacing between the blades. And uh, you can see here two more angles one is uh, defined or denoted by symbol psi and the other is denoted by theta. So, theta is basically the angle between tangent to the trailing edge and tangent to the camber line at the leading edge. So, this is the camber line which is shown here by dash and dots. So, if you draw a tangent at the trailing edge and a tangent at the leading edge, they both meet and intersect at a certain angle. 
So, this angle which is represented by theta is known as the camber angle of this particular blade. So, cascade blades will have a certain camber angle and that is uh, the angle subtended by the tangent to the camber line at the leading edge and the trailing edge. And then uh, the angle uh, which is shown here as psi is basically the uh, stagger of the blades that is these blades are set at a particular angle. So, stagger is sometimes also referred to as the setting angle and this is the angle between the chord line which is shown here and the axis of the cascade. So, this basically is the axis of the cascade. So, angle between the chord and the axis of the cascade is the uh, stagger angle and uh, so again as we mount the blades on the cascade blade cascade uh, turntable it can be set at a uh, desired angle. So, we can also change that and uh, that is basically known as the stagger or the setting angle, angle at which these blades are set with reference to the cascade axis. So, these are uh, the different terminologies used in cascade analysis and uh, some of them we have already seen in the last class when we are talking about velocity triangles that is the blade inlet angle and outlet angle and so on. So, um, the inlet angle that is shown here is basically what we had discussed in the last class, but uh, in this case since the blades are stationary we, on, we have only one angle there is no relative velocity here and that is why we just have alpha at the inlet and outlet which is basically the blade angle which, which is what we had denoted by beta in, in, in our previous class, but that was with reference to uh, the relative velocities. So, since there is no relative velocity here we just have an alpha and so incidence is the difference between the angle at which the flow is actually entering the blade to the angle at which the blade has actually been um, designed for at the inlet. Similarly, we have the deviation angle at the outlet, difference between the angle at which the velocity actually leaves the trailing edge to the angle of uh, the blade at the trailing edge that is denoted by delta. So, cascade uh, basically has all these different uh, terminologies that will uh, define some of the geometric parameters and uh, from these parameters it is possible for us to uh, also calculate uh, certain other performance parameters which we will discuss shortly. So, as I mentioned cascade uh, me measurements in a cascade will consist of measurement of pressures, velocities and flow angles and from these uh, measurements it is possible for us to uh, infer some information about the performance of uh, these cascade blades. And in cascade testing uh, we normally use certain special probes which are um, used to measure these exit total pressures and uh, the angles and as, uh, as well as the velocities. On the blade surface as I mentioned we use static pressure taps that is as the blades are fabricated or manufactured at that time certain pressure taps are embedded on the blade surface at the suction surface and the pressure surface and then uh, static pressure can be measured through these uh, pressure taps. Whereas, at the trailing edge of the blade that is where we measure uh, the total pressure and uh, the velocities and flow angles. Normally, we use certain special probes which are traversed and moved along the trailing edge of the blade to gather information on these parameters. So, for this purpose we use certain special probes which are known as claw probes or cobra probes or and so on. Uh, I will not probably go into details of them uh, yeah, in this particular lecture. So, special probes which are known as nulling probes are used in uh, at the exit if we need to measure the angles as well. They could be of different forms, they could be cylindrical, claw type or cobra type etcetera and uh, you can get more information on these type of probes in most of the textbook wherein we talk about uh, cascades. And uh, so, the measurements usually involve rotating the probes and that is why they are called nulling probes. Uh, as the probes are rotated then there are two different measurement ports at which pressure is measured and then those pressures are equalized at a certain angle of rotation. That also gives us an indication of the angle of uh, the flow at the exit. So, nulling probes are usually used at the exit for measurement of angles as well as some of these parameters like velocity, pressure and so on. So, let us now look at what are the different performance parameters which are used in cascade analysis.
I mentioned we measure basically velocity, then pressures that is both stagnation and static pressures and of course, the flow angles. And from these measured parameters, what more can we do? What can we, how can we post process these um, data that we have achieved from cascade testing to get some information about the performance of these blades. So, there are two basic uh, performance parameters that can be calculated or measured uh, from these uh, tests. One of them is known as the total pressure loss across the cascade and the other is with reference to the static pressure um, coefficient on the blade surface. So, cascade cascades are basically stationary blades and so there is no energy imparted on the flow and uh, unlike a rotor where there is an energy added to the flow and therefore, there is a total pressure rise in the rotor. Whereas, in a stator as you know there is no energy addition and because of frictional effects there is actually a total pressure loss. So, that is what happens in a cascade as well that um, there is a certain total pressure loss which occurs as the flow passes through a cascade. And this total pressure loss is um, highly sensitive to the inflow angle that is the incidence angle that is as you change the incidence angle the total pressure loss also changes drastically. And so, it is possible for us to um, from the cascade testing tell what is the band of um, incidence angles at which the total pressure uh, losses are minimum or what are the angles incidence angle at which total pressure losses increases substantially and that will help us in uh, keeping this in mind when we take up detailed analysis of the or design of the blade based on our uh, knowledge of uh, the cascade testing of these blades. So, one of the parameters that we are going to define is based on the total pressure and the loss in total pressure across the cascade. So, total pressure loss coefficient which is denoted here as W subscript P L C which is pressure loss coefficient is equal to P 01 which is the total pressure at the inlet of the cascade minus P 02 that is total pressure at the outlet of the cascade divided by half rho V 1 square where V 1 is the velocity at the inlet. So, this is uh, well the denominator is basically the dynamic pressure at the inlet P 01 is inlet stagnation pressure P 02 is exit stagnation pressure. So, uh, as you change the incidence angle the inlet parameters are likely to remain unchanged that, the, that is the inlet total pressure and the dynamic head remain unchanged it is the exit stagnation pressure which will keep changing. So, um, as you keep increasing the incidence whether it is positive incidence or negative incidence beyond a certain angle the flow is likely to separate from the surface and as it separates it will eventually lead to stalling of the blades. You might have learned that an airfoil as you keep increasing the angle of attack of an airfoil beyond a certain angle which is known as the stall angle the blade will separate the flow will separate from the blade surface and there is a drop in lift of the uh, of the airfoil. Something very similar to that happens here as well that as we change the incidence beyond a certain angle of incidence the flow would separate completely from the blade suction surface of the blade if it is a positive incidence and that could lead to stalling of the blade. So, from the cascade testing we could uh, we, we can basically tell what is the range of incidence angle for which the, the blades are safe to operate beyond which if you exceed the incidence beyond these angles there is a likelihood that the flow will separate from the blade surface. So, that is one of the aspects that is we can measure total pressure loss across the uh, cascade and uh, we can measure it as a function of incidence angle and so that we know the sensitivity of these blades to the in, uh, incoming angle that is the incidence angle. The second parameter that we are going to define is related to the, the blade itself that is uh, what is the pressure rise on the blade surface or loss of pressure in, in terms of static pressure on the blade surface. So, we are going to define this uh, static pressure on the blade surface with what is known as the static pressure coefficient or as usually denoted as C p. So, C p is basically the static pressure coefficient which is defined as p local which is the static pressure local minus the reference pressure that is p reference divided by half rho v 1 square. So, here p local is the blade surface 
static pressure at a particular point which could be on the cord uh, at any point on the cord of the air foil. And reference pressure is the reference static pressure which is usually measured at the inlet um, or the cascade inlet in a similar fashion as we measured P01 in as defined in the previous definition. So, C p is measured uh, on the blade surface and the C p distribution which is usually plotted as C p versus x by c that is um, position cord wise posi position on the blade surface. It basically gives us an idea about uh, the load distribution that is how the blades are loaded in terms of uh, the pressure ratio. So, we can get some idea about the blade loading from the C p distribution as it is plotted C p versus x by c. So, blade loading is one of the parameters we can infer from the C p distribution of these blades. So, we have defined two parameters one is total pressure loss coefficient which is basically the loss in total pressure across this cascade the other is the static pressure rise coefficient. Now, total pressure loss coefficient is measured at the trailing edge of the blade that is at the exit of the cascade we move a probe and as we as we traverse or move the probe, we measure total pressure at each point, compare that with the inlet total pressure, normalize that with the dynamic head inlet. And so, at the trailing edge as we as the probe approaches the trailing edge, we would see a significant increase in the total pressure loss. This is basically because of the uh, viscous effects as the flow passes on the blade surface, there is a viscous um, effect on near the blade surface that is basically the boundary layer fluid and that can lead to total pressure loss very close to the trailing edge of the blade. So, very close to the trailing edge of the blade it is likely that we see a certain a, a sudden increase in the total pressure loss coefficient and uh, away from the blade that is mid passage between two blades that is where the total pressure loss is likely to be the minimum. So, let me just show you one typical uh, plot of how the total pressure loss coefficient can change um, as we change the location of uh, the, the, the probe. So, as we move the probe let us say from position 0 all the way up to 10, we it, if we see such peaks very close to the blade trailing edge basically this are these, these peaks as you see here correspond to the uh, trailing edge location or location of the blade trailing edge and that is where you have the maximum total pressure loss due to viscous effects and uh, the wake of the blade wherein basically we have a lot of total pressure loss. And it is at these locations as you can see there is also a significant uh, change in the deflection um, at the trailing edge that is where which means that the flow is exiting the blade trailing edge at a slightly different angle than uh, the blade uh, angle at the trailing edge itself. So, uh, as we move or traverse the probe along the trailing edge, it is possible that we see such peaks in the uh, uh, total pressure loss coefficient, which basically correspond to the location of the blade trailing edge. So, um, as we change as we change the incidence angle, the, the magnitude of these uh, losses across the blades also will change. That is, as we keep increasing the incidence angle either to positive or the negative side, then the losses actually increase and uh, basically because as you keep increasing the incidence, the extent of the wake uh, shed by each of these um, cascade blades will also increase that is the viscous losses on the blade surface will increase as we increase the incidence angle. So, what basically will happen is that if you were to look at um, a normal and a stalled operation of the blade as I mentioned as the incidence exceeds certain angles, the flow will separate from the blade surface leading to stalling of the uh, cascade. So, let us take a look at uh, two different cases, one is a normal operation of the blade and the other is a stalled operation. The incoming flow uh, that is coming in at a velocity c 1 uh, where of, of an angle of either beta 1 or alpha 1 which is the same here and the flow under normal operation comes in with zero incidence in this case because the angles are the same there is no um, um, angle between the velocity as well as the blade inlet angle. Flow enters the cascade and leaves the cascade at uh, an angle beta 2 at uh, C 2 whereas, if you keep increasing the incidence 
as the incidence is increased and the blade approaches at a very high angle, then the angle at which it is approaching is much higher than the blade inlet angle itself, which means that there is a possibility that the flow will separate from the uh, suction surface of the blade. So, there is um, separated flow as you can see here on all the blades and this can lead to uh, stalling of the blade, which means that the blade will no longer perform the way it should have been. The total pressure loss coefficient in this case would be substantially higher than what it was under normal operation. So, as the incidence is increased beyond a certain um, range, then there is a risk of stalling of the blades and that is one of the aspects that uh, cascade testing should be able to tell us that what is the band of incidence at which for which the blade uh, operation will be safe. So, if we were to look at incidence versus total pressure loss coefficient, each cascade blades, uh, each set of cascade blades will have a certain uh, characteristic that is loss characteristic, which means that if you were to plot total pressure loss coefficient on y axis and incidence angles both negative as well as positive, then we would get a, um, um, a curve which would tell us that for these ranges of incidence angles, the total pressure loss is minimum. As you exceed the incidence angle, the total pressure loss is substantially higher and those substantially higher total pressure loss values will give us an indication that if the blades were to operate in that in those incidence angles, it is most likely that the blades were stalling. So, let me show you one typical um, such characteristic total pressure loss coefficient versus the incidence angle. This is for one particular um, cascade geometry, it, it, it will be different for different cascades. So, what is shown here is incidence angle both negative as well as positive incidence and total pressure loss on uh, loss coefficient on the y axis. So, you can see here that there is a certain range in, at least for this cascade it seems to be uh, more comfortable with negative incidences, whereas on the positive incidence we can see that the total pressure losses are substantially higher. So, if this cascade was to operate uh, between let us say minus 15 all the way up to 0 degrees, the total pressure loss is more or less the same. Whereas, if the ang if it were to be operating at an incidence of 10 degrees, total pressure loss is substantially higher than what it was at minus 10 degrees. So, from this is some information, this is one of the forms of information of which you can ob obtain from the cascade testing at different incidence angles, wherein we can uh, get some idea about the loss coefficient uh, as uh, the incidence angles are changed course, incidence angles of minus 20 degree or minus 10 for that matter is a very high incidence. Normally, incidence angles are kept um, close to 0, it is very kept very low because performance of the blade is very sensitive to these incidence angles. So, um, total pressure loss from the cascade testing uh, is one of the parameters that we get, uh, one of the information that we can get from um, testing of these blades in a cascade. Now, let us now look at what are the different uh, forms of losses in, in a compressor blade. There are different types of losses which we can identify uh, th that those are associated with compressor blades, not just cascade, it is true for any compressor blade as such. One of the forms of losses are known as viscous losses, we will discuss that also a little later. Viscous losses, the second form of loss is 3 D effects like uh, tip leakage flows or secondary flows these are not necessarily viscous flow viscous related effects, but these are also present in potential flows. The third type of losses could be shock losses, which are true for transonic compressors or those compressors operating very close to uh, uh, the Mach 1, at least the relative Mach number. And then the last form or type of losses are mixing losses. So, it is necessary that a designer is able to have some indication or some estimation of these losses, um, basically because it is required as a part of the design, we need to know what kind of losses are present in, in axial compressors and how is it that we can estimate these losses. But of course, these losses do not exist in isolation, there is a combination of all these losses present in a compressor. So, it is very difficult to distinguish and uh, isolate 
individual components of these losses. And total losses in a compressor is basically the sum total of these individual components of losses. So, viscous losses are uh, of different types. Now, viscous losses as you can uh, guess is due to the viscous effects and the presence of boundary layer and so on. So, the there are different forms of viscous losses. One such form of viscous loss is the profile loss. Profile loss is basically because of the shape uh, the basic geometry of the airfoil itself and uh, so that can lead to certain amount of skin friction losses that is known as the profile loss. The other form of viscous loss is known as annulus loss. Annulus loss is basically because of the growth of boundary layer at both the ends that is at the hub end as well as the casing end and as we move from the inlet of the axial compressor all the way for a multi stage compressor at the exit the boundary layer thickness keeps growing and so obviously there is an increase in annulus loss from inlet to the exit. And the third type of viscous loss are known as end wall losses end wall losses are due to the boundary layer effects in the corner that is junction between the blade surface and the casing or the hub. And uh, so, because of these corners there are um, corner uh, related losses which basically referred to as the end wall losses. So, there, these are three different forms of uh, viscous losses and uh, so, in, a, in an actual compressor you, one would have a combination of all the three different forms of viscous losses present. The other form of loss is the 3D effects. Uh, 3D effects include the secondary flows um, that is basically as the flow passes through a curved passage there are flow components which are introduced which are um, in addition to the normal flow component itself. These are known as secondary flows and losses associated with these are known as secondary flow losses. There could be then tip leakage flows that is um, this is true for a, a rotor blade tip leakage flows are not necessarily present in stators where the blades are fixed at both ends. In a rotor where the blade is, is fixed only at the hub and at the tip it is free the, there is a flow which escapes from the pressure surface to the suction surface that is known as the tip leakage flow. So, tip leakage flow basically involves flow from the pressure surface this is the pressure surface of the blade, blade and this is the suction surface of the blade. At the tip of the blade because it is open it is not fixed to the casing flow from the pressure surface leaks or moves towards the suction surface and then because of the rotation and the incoming flow it escapes in the form of a vortex and that is known as a tip leakage vortex. So, if, if we were to look at this in, in a simple schematic form in a, in a rotor blade let us say this is the pressure surface of this particular blade and this is the suction surface of this blade. Tip leakage vortex is flow from the pressure surface to the suction surface and that manifests itself in the form of a vortex and it is known as a tip leakage vortex. In addition to that because the flow is passing through a curved passage there would also be the presence of these secondary vortices or, or secondary flows as, uh, as they are also known as. And so, there is a loss of total pressure in all this that is because of the tip leakage vortex as well as the secondary vortices loss of total pressure associated with all these. So, these are basically because of the three dimensional effect. Suppose, the blade was to be fixed at this end and uh, we were there is no boundary layer on this su these surfaces that becomes a two dimensional flow and the presence of tip leakage vortex is absent in, uh, in such a flow. So, tip leakage vortex is purely a three dimensional uh, effect and uh, the other forms of losses are shock losses. Shock losses are basically because of interaction of shocks at the blade tip with the primary flow and it is basically of concern in transonic rotors that is modern day uh, fans and compressors uh, tend to have uh, relative Mach numbers in, in supersonic regime. And so, these are basically known as transonic uh, rotors and there is um, loss associated with the interaction of shock and uh, the primary flow and the boundary layer. And the last form of losses are known as mixing losses basically because of interaction of the flow from rotor with the stator or the stator wakes with the succeeding rotor and so on. So, it is basically the uh, effect of or interaction of um, the wakes which are uh, as a result of the rotor or the stator interacting with the subsequent stage. So, mixing 
um, losses basically pertain to uh, interaction of these um, wakes with the subsequent stages. So, all these losses put together or to some total of all these losses are equal to the total loss um, that are incurred in, in a compressor stage. So, in uh, the annulus wall region basically it, it can actually account for about that is basically the viscous losses can account for almost 50 percent of the total loss. Leakage vortex can interact with the blade boundary layer, casing boundary layer and secondary flows. And as a result of this, there is a there is a large turbulence uh, increase in the mixing zone because of the interaction of the wakes with the subsequent stages. And uh, if there is a shock wave present, as in the case of transonic rotors, there is an additional complexity which is um, which is introduced. And in the case of a hub, uh, if you are looking at the hub region, there are also um, presence of corner uh, stalls because of boundary layer growth on the blade surface and the um, hub surface itself. So, as you can see here, there is a very complex complicated interaction between these different loss generating mechanisms and uh, interaction of all this uh, makes it very difficult for one to segregate these different loss components and uh, estimate these loss components individually. In literature, you will find lot of empirical correlations for estimating these loss components. And of course, um, as they are empirical in nature, they are not very accurate for all uh, different for a range or variety of uh, compressor geometries. And there is a geometry dependence on in, in most of these empirical uh, correlations. So, um, what we have discussed uh, today, let me just recap our discussion in uh, today's lecture. We were discussing about cascade. We started our uh, discussion with cascade and defining what is a cascade we had a look at what is a typical cascade wind tunnel and uh, what are the other forms of cascade tunnels which are prevalent. And uh, we also discussed about nomenclature which is associated with a cascade and uh, then we also discussed about the parameters that we measure from a cascade testing and uh, the information that can be achieved as a result of cascade testing. Then towards the end of this today's lecture, we also discussed about uh, the losses that how do we classify uh, broadly classify losses in an axial compressor and what are the sources of these different losses. So, these are some of the topics that we discussed in today's lecture and we will continue our discussion on axial compressors in the next lecture as well. We will uh, have some discussion in next lecture on what is known as a free vortex theory. We will have uh, some preliminary discussion on free vortex theory. We will then discuss in detail about the characteristics of axial compressor. We will begin discussion with uh, single stage axial compressor characteristics followed by a detailed discussion of multi stage axial compressor characteristics. So, we will take up these topics for discussion during our uh, next lecture that would be lecture number 16.